And today with us, we have David Bernstein. He's an MD. He's got a fantastic online course, Power of Five Life. And we're going to be talking about that. And uh, welcome, welcome to my show, doctor. Oh, thank you for having me, Bo. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you today. Um, you have a history of being a geriatrician. Am I saying that right? Saying it perfectly. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what you do now. Thank you for asking. Okay. I grew up on Long Island, New York, and went to college in St. Louis. And while I was growing up, uh, I was inspired by my father's determination in life. He was a combat wounded World War II veteran. He mm -hmm. taught me a lot about discipline and determination. Um, as I was applying for a college, I came across a National Geographic magazine that had a, on the cover a centenarian. I learned a new word for my vocabulary at that time and uh, why people or where people uh, lived in the world who lived to be 100. Mm -hmm. I observed my grandparents getting poor medical care, and I promised my mother if I were to become a doctor, I would do a better job. I met a high school graduate from our class, from our school, who in 10 years became a best-selling author. So I decided that would be one more thing that I would do. And uh, went to college, medical school, and practiced for 40 years, uh, internal medicine and geriatrics in Clearwater, Florida. And I observed people's habits, what made them live longer. And I studied up to find out what people can do to get their best possible health. And so awesome. that's a little bit about me. And you still live in Florida? Still live in Florida, retired two years ago. Oh, and right. I'm in a period of, that I call my re-inspirement. You're living the good life down yeah. Florida way. All right. Um, well, I'm going to ask you, first of all, Dr., um, how does aging affect our bodies? And I know that that's a general question because some people it's not going to affect so much, other people more. But in general, um, why do we age and why do the aging problems happen to us? Well, aging is inevitable. Um, we start aging from the minute we're born. Uh, but some people will age faster than others. And, and there's a lot of science behind it. There's some things that aren't as well known. Um, but I have a lot of understanding that aging has to do with this chronic inflammation we have in our body. Mm -hmm. And that chronic inflammation uh, contributes to three of the most important diseases that I saw as a physician. And that was cardiovascular disease, cancer, and neurodegenerative diseases. And mm -hmm. neurodegenerative diseases are things like can uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and mm -hmm. other forms of dementia. Mm -hmm. So that was a catch area of where most of my patients became ill and chronically ill. And um, so I endeavored to figure out what the underlying causes, what contributes to inflammation. Inflammation is what none of us want. We love to get rid of that. Um, I know in my own history, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of my problems with my, my migraines is a, an inflammation somehow, swelling, my brain, that sort of thing, heart, uh, same. And what causes inflammation? Is it many things or is it mainly food or what, what is, what inflammation is what a swelling on the inside of our body? Well, it's your body's reaction to something that they don't like going on inside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So an example, an easy example of inflammation is when you get a splinter. Your body says, I don't like that foreign body in my finger. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to pour out these, these chemicals and these hormones uh, to combat it and make it go away. And then we could make it go away by removing the splinter. But there are other things that go on in our body that create that same process. And so I have always believed that people can remember five things. If we give them five things to remember, they'll remember five things. You get okay. beyond that, it gets a little more difficult. What are so they? I came up with five things. Mm -hmm. Avoid sweets, mm -hmm. avoid stress, get more sleep, sweat. And I love the fifth one, sex. Mm -hmm. Get more sex. Mm -hmm. So if I can dissect that a little bit, avoid sweets. Mm -hmm. It's really about sugar, 
It's about carbohydrates. It's about the fact that those foods and processed foods, which all have high fructose corn syrup in them, those foods created inflammation in our body. And that inflammation will oftentimes affect one of the biggest organs in our body, which is our blood vessels. Blood vessels of our heart, our legs, our lungs, our entire body and our brain. And so this inflammatory process leads to heart attacks and the number one cause of death in this country, which is heart disease and heart attacks. And even though technology has reduced heart attacks and cardiovascular deaths by 75% in the last 50 years, it's still the number one cause of death. So I believe we have control over it by what we eat. And so if I jump ahead a little bit, a Mediterranean type diet is a diet that's full of fresh fruits and vegetables, and we can control the protein that we eat by, by getting them mainly from plants and reduce the sugars in our meals. And, and even fruits, which are sweet, have lots of fiber in them that make them uh, less inflammatory. So yeah. exactly the, the S, my first S of sweets is all about what we eat. Mm-hmm. So yes. This. Yeah. For me, food is everything. It's either a poison or it's a medicine for me. And I've been this way since I was a little girl. That's why I'm interested in health and particularly from a food uh, and environmental perspective on, on how all these things affect our health. So inflammation, for instance, if uh, why does your body get inflammation in one part because let's say sugar let's use sugar as an example why does someone's brain get inflamed from sugar uh, and someone's heart another person or is it all is the whole inside of our body becoming inflamed and we have weak spots at different places we might have weak spots in different places <clears throat> but i believe it's a systemic chronic inflammation so the, the blood vessels in the brain are as affected as the blood vessels in your heart and lungs and everywhere else. And, and that inflammatory process is that age accelerator. So if you want to decelerate your aging process, the, the five things that I mentioned are the things you would do to decelerate it. And, and then there's people who are doing a lot of basic science to try and figure out how you can turn that clock back and start aging backwards. Right. Uh, and there's some additives that people talk about that, that I won't talk about today, but there's ongoing research about that. And, and do and you believe that? I don't, and part of the reason I don't talk about it is I don't know that those things are tried and true okay. yet. You're right. But, That's what but, I was going to ask anytime you. anytime I talk and I listen and read about people who talk about re reversing aging or reducing the risk of aging, they would all start out with my, my five things. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> and if I would say that, well, there's a few more than those five. OK, well, there's um, smoking is is sort of an obvious one and and um, doing things that aren't safe, like when over the age of 65 or 70 and climbing on ladders and roofs. And, and so safety is an issue, too. But th again, we're getting off the track because that has nothing to do with inflammation. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I can proceed and tell you that uh, stress is another inflammatory process in yes. our body. Mm -hmm. and, and so you and I live long enough and we either had our own stress or we've seen other people who have stress. And, and what happens in that stressful situation is there was a release of certain neurochemicals like cortisol, which is a biggie, which is comes from the adrenal gland. And that causes, it's another cause of inflammation in blood vessels. So what we would do is we would want to curtail stress. We would find wor a work environment that's best for us, relationships that are best for us in terms of stress reduction, and then do things like learn to meditate, learn to be mindful, learn to walk in, 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 in nature. Uh, even if you can't get outside, bring some nature into your home. I've just been reading about that today. You know, make your home feel more like nature. Make sure to open windows and look outside and smell fresh air. And, and those types of things have profound impact and make our health better uh, versus having all this inflammatory stuff going on leading to the same diseases I mentioned. So do people have heart attacks more often if they have a lot of stress? The, the, um, you know, the old movies where someone, you know, grabs their heart, they're, they're yelling at somebody and then they, you know, fall over and die. 
is is that kind of like a truthful does that happen i mean can stress cause us to have a heart attack um gonna say it's maybe an over exaggeration but it's not far from the truth Mm -hmm. um and I'm not the the supreme basketball fan, uh, but in the lead up to the final four this year, either one or two coaches had to have their blood vessels yeah, have stented. Oh so my gosh! College, coaching college football is uh, college basketball is, is not without its stress, uh, and we've seen that in some of the coaches that um, from where this has occurred and stress. Of, of any, the, the, the real stress is like a, a motor vehicle accident or surgery or a medical illness that uh, creates stressful parts in the body. But the psychological stress creates some of the same types of cortisol release that is unhealthy. And you now we've known since we were kids that, oh, that guy's really stressed and he's really unhealthy and look at what he looks like. Um, and, and it's borne out in, the, in terms of the science and the things that we've learned. Um, and we can offset it. I talk one about diet for your eating and, and meditation and mindfulness for, um, for stress. What's your third of the five? So number three is a euphemism for exercise. I call it sweat. So we know that people who sit for extended periods of time are more apt to be, have chronic inflammation. And we talk about, we read about it, couch potatoes uh, are at higher risk for disease and people who are more active at less, um, at less risk. So exercise is, is the promoted somewhere between 30 to 90 minutes a day of vigorous exercise or some moderate exercise, such as walking or jogging or spinning, which are some of the things I do. Strength training is really helpful in terms of making your muscles and bones stronger, uh, reducing people's risk for osteoporosis. Um, uh, Exercise is probably the best antidepressant that ever has been invented. There's never been a pill that works better than exercise. And one of the things I found in my research was that Exercise reduces the risk of recurrent cancer by 35%. Really? So who wouldn't go and get their chemotherapy and say, I'm going to go out and exercise and get an extra 35% chance that I'm not going to get recurrent disease. So we need to realize that that's an important component of um, our daily lives and and add it on to all the other things I've mentioned so far. Well, let's move on to number four. And so number four is sleep. Yes. You know, by the time I got to college, I wasn't a great, I, I, I was, I'm a night owl. So I'd be up at, late at night, but then go to school and got, went to college. And, you know, it was like a badge of honor to get very little sleep. Yeah, and right. What a horrible mistake that was. Mm-hmm. We do most of our, our learning and, and processing information while we're sleeping. And if we really limit ourselves, we are really, taken away from the studying we may have done when we were kids. And then as a physician with a phone next to my bed that would ring quite often, um, sleep was not something I placed enough emphasis on. But for the end of my career um, and with learning about how important seven or eight hours of sleep was, I worked on doing that. And in my retirement, um, it was my number one goal is to get my sleep up over seven or eight hours because it was really difficult to incorporate that. But it's amazingly important in terms of avoiding our risk for dementia, uh, avoiding risk for cardiovascular disease. And there was so much sleep apnea in my practice that um, was undiagnosed. And, and sleep apnea is kind of like someone suffocating you in the middle of the night. And they, they suffocate you and then they go away and then you gas for air and you go back to sleep. And it, it, it's another one of those releases of these neurochemicals like adrenaline and your heart goes up and blood pressure goes up and you gas for air and go back to sleep. And it's this interruption oh, of sleep yes. and interruption of REM sleep. Um, and it's really hazardous. And it it's another one of those things that adds to your risk for dementia, your risk for heart disease, your risk for cancer. And so... It's important to kind of have so far those four of five things that we can do to live happy and healthier. And and by the way, we may all live to be 85 or 90 
although life expectancies in the U.S. have dropped in the last few years, and they were flat even before that. But to to retire at 65 and become disabled at 66 and live yeah. to be 86 and have 20 years of disability is yeah. horrible. Yeah. And many people who I experience in my practice, they'd say, I just want to live a really good life and then die when I can't do the things I like to do. And, yeah. and that's pretty much what anybody would want rather than live after a stroke or a heart attack or something that disables them. So I encourage people to follow my five things uh, because it would reduce that risk along with the risks of heart disease, cancer. And so many people are concerned about avoiding the risk of dementia. And, and this is one of the formulas for that. Just this week, the study came out on all the major news networks that they are discovering that sleep problems can cut our lives short by several years. Um, and that it's, not only important, but it's vital <clears throat> if you want to live a long, healthy life to get good sleep. And, and you're so correct in what you just said. And it's not the first time that all the major news networks have heard that information because studies come out about sleep and its effect repeatedly um, year after year. So there's, there's this load of evidence about it. It's finally getting out into the public so people can hear about it um, why can't we why can't we sleep like um we should what's the problem is it stress uh, tv phones all of the above yeah i mean you, you know um a bedroom is for sleep and sex mm -hmm. that's it and when you bring a newspaper a television a, a smart t screen with a, a light in your bedroom uh, if you read something that's controversial and it gets on your mind, um, if you eat in bed, if you do other activities in your bedroom, your bedroom becomes like Grand Central Station right. and it becomes a place where it's not a haven for sleep. Mm -hmm. So we have to set up our, our bedroom for doing that. And um, we live in a partisan society. So people are thinking about all the things that are going on in the world and we need to give appropriately from that the stuff that we, you just mentioned, we need to give this proper attention to the importance of sleep. And if you're not sleeping well, seek good medical advice, not a pill, because pills are not an answer. That will end your life sooner. I read that study several years ago that if you take a sleeping pill, it takes months, maybe years off your life. Absolutely. I true. wonder why. Why do you think that is? Um. It's a good question. I'm not sure I know all of them, but one of the sleeping pills that people take are over-the-counter pills like um, Sleepies or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And it's diphenhydramine, which is the same as Benadryl, which is an antihistamine. Yes. And it, it actually can promote the development of Alzheimer's disease. Oh, and it also gosh. could unmask Alzheimer's disease in people who are kind of on the edge because mm -hmm. it blocks a certain neurochemical called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is an important ingredient in terms of memory and, and brain function. So really, our un it's the undoing of ourselves by taking pills at night. And learning learning the best way to sleep really becomes the important issue. And there's, uh, there's uh, clinics that do something called CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, that help people in six or se seven sessions to learn how to do the most effective, get the most effective sleep. Okay, well, let's move on to the fifth one. Well, the fifth one is a three-letter word called sex. <laughs> and I'm in a generation, and I think you are, where um, we learn that sex sells. So there's cosmopolitan on in grocery stores when you go to check out, and um, um, that was the word of the day. So that's the word I used. But it's really <laughs> about socialization, connections, companionship. It, it's about intimacy. And those things are incredibly important. And they do just the opposite of what stress does. So they release hormones that are pleasant and helpful for us. Uh, we have a release of serotonin, which is sort of a natural antidepressant. And those connections are favorable because you're with someone who cares about you and will say, you know, you don't look so good or you're coughing, go to the doctor. So there are people looking after you. Um, 
and there's opportunities for you to express yourself with, when you're in a group with other people. And, exactly. and what's, what's really been discovered in the last few years, and, and I started writing about it even in my Power of Five book, even before, was the opposite of intimacy is loneliness. Mm. That's a health hazard in this country and mm -hmm. around the world. So it's the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being obese. Mm. So we know that obesity is a risk and we mm -hmm. know that smoking cigarettes is a risk. So is loneliness. And, and personally speaking, as a physician, I would have 18 friends bring make appointments to see me for 15 or 20 minutes every day. Yeah. So my day was full of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had an opportunity to take care of them and get a warm and fuzzy feeling about taking care of them and then interacting with them and having right. social time with them. Um, and when I entered my retirement, I knew and I've worked on intentionally making friends and connecting with people. And I wouldn't say I go up to strangers, but people that I've known in the community that I didn't know very well. I'd say, let's have a cup of coffee. Yeah. And I've done this with four or five people, and I have, you know, kind of a circle of, of people that I, I, I connect with uh, every month or every couple of weeks. And then I encourage people to join a club and, and do something they can enjoy and, and be with other people, because it's so important to have that in our lives. And if we didn't know it, when COVID came along, it made a lot of that worse, and we really discovered how uh, important connections are and the physical connection. I mean, I love doing Zooms and, and this is a lot of fun and I couldn't personally be with you or you're on the, the other coast of the United States, but uh, making connections is really important. Well, one last question on aging. Um, is it <clears throat> as genetic as we think it is? Is it in our DNA, so to say, um, where that we'll have a short life or a long life? It seems like some people's families they live to be in their 90s, their hundreds. It's just who they are. And then other people are in families that, you know, don't make it to 60. So is there something there? When I read the literature on this, about 20% of the population will have a genetic predisposition to either a longer or a shorter life. So mm. genetics does play a role. But you know, your your family plays a role too in whether they eat fatty foods and don't mm -hmm. exercise and that's the environment you grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, the environments where people live these long lives and live to be 100 tend to be in communities where elders are respected and and they're they're um, they live long and they 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 tend to work till very late in their lives and they tend to be in farming communities where they have to walk and work right. and, and and they they have sort of the power of five built into what they do mm. and it's then it's hard and and you know they're sort of remote communities so there may be some inbreeding of of uh in terms of the genetics but most of the genetic stuff um tends to be a small component of it which means if you have good genes take care of them take don't go climbing on roofs don't do risky right. things don't drive at four in the morning and protect your genes and if you have bad genes and you know it you know, become a vegetarian, become a vegan, watch your diet, exercise regularly, and do those things that can reduce your inflammation and offset some of those genetic burdens that you would have. Great. Well, I know um, you teach an online course and you have lots of good books. Um, tell us a little bit about how people can find that. Well, my website is powerofthenumber5life.com. Tell us again about the Power of Five Life, and you've got some gifts or something that you're giving away. That my website is powerofivelife.com. I okay. write blogs every couple of months uh, or two a month, and my wife posts uh, delicious recipes twice a month. And we have a free gift for people who listen, the powerofivelife.com slash gift. Um, and they will have a choice of a summer salad or a holiday recipe book. And um, also available on my website is my Power of Five Life course, which is powerofivelife.com slash achieve, A-C-H-I-E-V-E. -E. Perfect. Well, I've just enjoyed our time together so much. And best of everything to you, doctor. Thank you, Bo. I appreciate being invited. Love chatting with you. Today. Okay. Bye-bye.